Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Andrew Cooper Writer Show. Of course, I'm your host, Andrew Cooper Writer, after all the shows named after me. And uh, I'm coming to you today. I've got a very special episode. I've got uh, State House Rep Mark Hart coming on to talk about the special session that uh, just concluded regarding Eastern Kentucky flood relief here in Kentucky, where they spent some money, what they spent it on, how they spent it. And I'm going to ask them some questions there. But before I bring them on real quick, guys, make sure you like, comment, subscribe. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please throw the review that uh, helps out. I am told if you're watching on the Facebooks, hits the shares, hit the comment. That helps out too as well. Um, and as always, if you're catching this in a video, you can catch this as a podcast on Spotify, Apple, and everywhere else that, that you engage in podcasts as far as that goes. So you don't have to sit there watching the video the entire time. And as always, you can sign up for our text alerts. You can text the word Liberty to 33777. So without further ado, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, State House Rep Mark Hart. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for oh, taking time for out. Me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, first, we had a special session to help out Eastern. Can well, before we do that, Mark, why don't you go ahead, tell the audience what areas you represent, how long you've been in the house, and just what your background is. All right. Uh, my, uh, my district is the 7th House District. It is comprised of all of Pendleton County, uh, three precincts in Campbell County, seven precincts in Kenton County, and three precincts in Boone County. So I'm like the quintessential Northern Kentucky rep now because I have all the counties. <laughs> Which is interesting because, you know, you used to cover like Cynthia. I, and... I was more Central Kentucky. My old district was um, all of Pendleton, all of Harrison, and part of Scott. Well, of course, Scott and Harrison County are in Central Kentucky, and, and Pendleton County is kind of like that border county between Central and Northern Kentucky. Uh, but, you know, with the population shifting uh, east to west and west to east and north to south, uh, as they shifted everybody around, it, it come right up and got me and pushed me right up into northern Kentucky. So, Well, and how long have you been a house rep for? Uh, I came in with the majority in 2017 uh, when the Republicans took back uh, the House. So I was elected in November of 2016. So I just finished my sixth session and this will be finishing my sixth year as a state rep now i am told you are something of a hero i'm told uh, as a volunteer <laughs> firefighter you um heroically risked your life saving some lives and and that's kind of some background but what'd you work in before being a state house rep and, actually and... i'm a, i'm a retired lexington kentucky firefighter okay I retired from lexington in uh, january 2017 when i came into the house uh and, uh, and I, re I was a fire officer. I was a lieutenant with Lexington Fire Department and a paramedic and uh, worked out of Station 15 over around the Shillito Park uh, area, Fayette Mall, and, and that area of the city. Uh, and I also, in, two in August 2019, retired as a captain from Pendleton County EMS, where I worked as a paramedic part-time. Okay. And, and, and Overall, what is the about 31 years of experience in the fire and EMS world? And fire and EMS world. Okay. And what made you run for state house rep? Well, actually, while I was working uh, in the as a firefighter paramedic, I got involved. In, I lived in Falmouth, uh, Kentucky, there in Pendleton County. I got involved in local politics, and I served eight years on Falmouth City Council, and then I finished it up four years as mayor. And in, in the middle of all that, I served uh, – Governor Ernie Fletcher had appointed me to serve uh, out of – a magisterial did, uh, seat where somebody had passed away. Uh, I was beat in the primary by six votes, and I come back and ran for my seat that I just vacated on council and got reelected. So I served as a magistrate for about eight and a half, nine months, and then went immediately back into the, my seat on city council. So Okay, so you've got a little bit of a background. A little bit government. of background in local government, yes. Okay, gotcha. Now, um, it just, it just one more little general question for you. What is, if, if you had to describe who is, I don't know, whether it's a governmental philosophical speaker or a current person in office, who do you look at that everybody could kind of latch on to or research that shows you most agree with, like I said, that could be an economic philosopher or somebody in office that kind of says how you feel government's role is in, in our lives? Well, I'll tell you, uh, 
there there could be several people that fit that would fit that uh, that mold. But uh, I talked quite a bit with uh, Congressman Thomas Massey, and actually I talked more with his state director and some of his staff than I do him. But uh, that that's a one of the well. That's because we all like Chris McCain more. But yeah, you know. <laughs> and I have to admit, me, me and Chris just shared a few beers together. <laughs> I'm just joking, Thomas. Okay, I'm just joking. Thomas is always up in D.C. He's never around. He can't come and join in on. The I know party. he's got the hard work to do. But no, uh, I mean, when I, when I'm researching uh, data for especially uh, event or issues that are, are more on the federal level, that's one of my go-to people. One of my closest friends is uh, Billy Matthews, who's the state field director for uh, Senator Rand Paul. So that's the, so when I'm looking to uh, get help or get educated on some uh, federal issues that are affecting my district and our state, that's two of the go-to people or the camps that I go to a lot, Senator Paul and, and Congressman Massey. So we go into a special session here and – you know, we've we've kind of covered some of this on prior podcasts where the governor sets the agenda. The governor has to call the special session um, and and it's used to appropriate funds as far as that goes and continue on the state of emergency for federal reasons. That's more of a technicality with the federal government that you have to be in a state of emergency there. But what is if, if, if you could explain to the viewers how some of the pregame works. So, you know, there's a lot of discussions beforehand, things like that. How, what is it like leading up to a special session? Well, it's very um, kind of indicative of the, of the issue that we're facing. Like this special session, uh, the representatives and senators that were, uh, that represent the areas that were directly affected along with um, uh, people from the governor's staff, uh, the, uh, chairman and staff from the appropriations revenue committee they worked behind the scenes to prepare the bill that we ended up passing uh to get the numbers and 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 to figure out what initially we could do to help monetarily to help the region so in this case i i'm I'm on the a and r committee i had uh once when the bill was drafted then we started the a and committee started meeting and doing our things. Of course, you know, the bill's got to pass out of committee before it goes to the House uh, for a, a vote in the same way in the Senate. So, uh, but, then, but it's kind of indicative of the issue. A similar process happened back uh, with the tornadoes in Western Kentucky. The representatives that, that, that were in the areas that were mostly affected, they worked with people from the governor's office and staff people to get stuff ready for when we – uh, but we didn't have to go into a special session because that was right before we went into regular session. So it was more or less they were drafting the bill that they presented to us to, of their needs. And so, you know, one of the things that when when we do special sessions, and, and I know, of course, you you have your limitations of how you can address this. But one thing that, you know, I always dislike is that the bill is prepared behind the scenes. You guys get in and you get out in a few days. That's OK. But, you know, one issue is I, I feel like the citizens don't have as much time to give input because they don't get to see the bill quite like you do during regular session. There are several days the bill is there. You have times to talk to your state house reps and, and your state senators about it. So, you know, you know, one thing I guess frustrating about the special session process to citizens like myself is the lack of, I don't know, what do you call it, opportunity? To voice but, opinions, and I think I think a lot of that is just the time thing. We're we're trying to get it. We're trying to get to one when we come in a special session. It costs so much money. We're trying to be the most efficient with our time so that we can we spend this least amount of the taxpayers' dollars as we can. But like in this situation, this is kind of an emergency situation. We're trying to get help or help and relief down there to help them start getting rebuilt, get their lives back. So we don't have a lot of time. Uh, but I totally get the frustration. I mean, they do a real as soon as they get stuff drafted, and and, and they they do a pretty good job getting it out to us. Uh, but a lot of times they can't release it; it won't be released to the public until it's presented to the committee. Uh, and it's just a lot of times it's just a time thing. It's not the fact that any any one person is trying to keep it from you. It's right. just the fact that by the time we go through the process and we cross our our cross our T's and dot our eyes. Uh, we run out of time, but I, I totally get the frustration when you're trying to follow and, and learn. 
Uh, right, right. Now, this special session here, there's really only one bill. Of course, you saw Senate Bill 1, House Bill 1 for, for our, our listeners there. Um, as we know, it, you can do this thing where you have mere bills in both uh, chambers, so that right. way it speeds the passage process. So essentially, they're one bill, but the Senate and the House are able to vote on them at the exact same time. Um, how much did we end up appropriating in this uh, bill? We appropriated, let's see. I knew he was going to ask this question, so I wanted to make sure I got you the correct number. <laughs> so I wrote this down. Uh, it, we appropriated uh, $212.7 million, and that and that was for the what we called the Eastern Kentucky Relief Plan. Um, okay. And $212 million. Yeah, and basically what well, Eastern Kentucky Safe is, I guess, the vehicle that we're using or the, the fund that we're using to move the money around. And so the bill, we created the Eastern Kentucky Safe uh, funding mechanism. The bill appropriates money to that fund, but we also appropriate ma- money from that fund uh, as we start helping to pay and, and delve it out to the people who qualify to get the, the relief. Uh, in essence, uh, what we did, uh, 150, and I'm just going to read, this is real short, so I'm just going to read this to you so I don't miss anything. Sure. Uh, 150 million of of uh, the uh, well, let me back up a little bit. We appropriate 200 million dollars from the budget reserve trust fund, and that's the state's 2.7 billion dollar rainy day fund. Sure. Uh, and then we uh, appropriated uh, almost, I think it was around, let's see, uh, nearly 12.7 million in physical year 2022-2023 from the state physical recovery fund of America. Uh, Plan Act of 2000. That's the well, and real quick here on that trust fund that you're talking about, that rainy day uh, fund. Oh, the rainy, okay. One thing I want to point out to listeners, and we've talked about this, if the Democrats had their way, that fund wouldn't exist. Let's be very clear. I oh, mean, uh, you know, Bashir, I believe this last session, what, he wanted to spend every single dime of this. He would have spent it. And, and, and that was kind of their uh, 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 their plan or that's their, uh, uh, you know, they did it every year. Let me... Let me back up a little bit. In 1997, when the big flood hit Kentucky uh, in this little, the town of Falmouth, where I live, two thirds of the town was wiped off, wiped out. Uh, we experienced a lot of what Eastern Kentucky is going through right now. We got federal help uh, through FEMA and different programs, the Small Business Administration, different uh, programs like that. We, me, and me personally, did not receive any help uh, from the state of Kentucky. But there, there wasn't no money there. There wasn't a rainy day fund like we got. The actions of the General Assembly over the past uh, couple budgets and the past uh, uh, four or five years has helped us create the $2.7 billion rainy day fund, you, you see. And we now have the money, and, and we're able to use that money for what it's intended for emergencies, just like what they're experiencing in uh, East Kentucky, just like what they experienced in Western Kentucky. So I'm very proud to have been a part of every one of the legislate, legislation sessions that helped create that fund. And now that we're actually using it for one of its intended purposes, you know, I hold no ill will or anything against the state back in 97 when I got flooded. They didn't have the resource. The resource wasn't there. Nobody, uh, we didn't count on it. We didn't depend on it. It, I mean, it was just the way life was in. But now we've created this resource, and it's a great resource. I mean, look what we're able to do for the citizens of Kentucky. We don't have to depend solely on the federal government for help. And so I'm, I'm very proud of that fact. So this this $212 million, $200 million of it came from the $2.7 billion rainy well, day fund yeah. which which and and i covered this in prior podcasts you know the herald leader wrote wrote a little article about it and i did not like the words they used they said that the state can afford to be charitable um not the state could afford we that that they meaning you the general assembly could afford to be charitable yeah, I don't, as I don't if like, i don't like that i don't like the that i don't wording. like that one either because we're not it's not charitable we're being responsible with the taxpayers dollars they pay their taxes to receive services and benefits from the state. We're not being charitable. The taxpayers paid for this. All we did was set up the fund that give them the opportunity to, or, or the insurance policy that they needed for when something happened. 
So I don't think it's being charitable. I think we're doing the responsible thing and we're utilizing the taxpayers' dollars effectively and more efficiently for these types of emergencies. So well, I, 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 I would agree with you. <laughs> and I and I think we can agree that you know, we, we both feel uncomfortable anytime people start asking government to do charity work. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's not really their role. Um, so out of this 212 million, um, I, and I know I cut you off earlier when you're going through it there to just rewind on the trust there. What did the money go to? What, what's, okay. what's it? Go yeah. To? Uh, well, 150, and like I said, I'm going to read this cause I don't want to miss anything. Sure. Sure. Uh, 150 million of the 200 million uh, will be provided to the Department of Military Affairs Division of Emergency Management to provide financial support to cities, counties, school districts, state agencies, and non and nonprofit or public utility service providers located in the areas in the presidential named in the presidential uh, disaster area or declaration. Uh, the use of this portion includes reimbursement for services personnel and equipment provided during the response and recovery phases, cost of replacement or repair of publicly owned buildings and their contents, and advancement and advancement of funds to local governments, utilities, and school districts awaiting insurance claims and federal emergency management agency disaster assistance. So do, do they, and, and you may not have the answer to this, so it sounds like that $150 million is going, in this case, specifically to government entities, to cover the cost of, you know, whether that's the, the search and rescue additional costs. Yeah. And, and, but, but you said something in there about um, covering costs until insurance reimbursement. Do they have to, and you may not know the answer, do they have to pay this back to the state once insurance reimburses them or if the, um, the way, uh, the way the language in the bill uh, and I don't have the bill. I do I have the bill in front of me. Well, I'm not uh, the way it works. So I understand they uh, if the city let's just say if the city received a hundred million dollars from uh, reimbursement from FEMA, they would be expected to pay the reimbursement back. If they do do not receive the money from FEMA, then they won't have to pay back. And here's here's an example. Let's say they needed a hundred thousand dollars to get their water plant up and working and get the water system back. If FEMA's, uh, so the state's going to give them the $100 uh, million that they need. If FEMA only reimburses them, say, $75 million, the state won't require them to pay the other $25 million. But if they do get money in, if so, if, money, so in a way, we're, we're floating. Yes. So, so a chunk of that is we're essentially floating the local municipalities, government organizations that are awaiting payouts from insurance or other places in, in to make it to where the citizens aren't experiencing a lack of services while we're waiting for that money to come in. Correct. You're absolutely correct on that. And then, okay. So that's 150 million. Sounds like it's going directly to mostly government entities. Yeah, and, and and reimbursement and I might've misspoken. It's 115 million for that portion. Oh, okay. But then we have uh, 45 million to be provided to the Kentucky transportation cabinets, highway budget, for the state matching funds to pay for bridge and road repairs and replacements. Uh, okay. And then we have 40 million will be provided to the Department of Education for financial assistance to school districts to support repairs of school buildings, facilities, additional transportation costs for displaced students, students where they're transporting them to other facilities while schools are being rebuilt, and the wraparound services for school children and families recovering from the impacts of the storms and the floods. Okay. Okay. So, so we're up there to. Yeah. 200 million there. 200 million we're up to where it's going specifically, it sounds like to, to mostly government entities. Lot, to, lot, basically infrastructure type things, infrastructure. but it's not all infrastructure because like you mentioned earlier, paying for some of the the, the, the services that, we, that was used to mitigate the actual emergency and, and stuff like that. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, and then the other 12.7 million uh, were taken out of the state physical. Re basically, we're to, uh, everybody's a fair... Um, everybody is aware of the ARPA funds. Um, yeah. And so we're taking the 12.7 million out of our ARPA funds uh, and we're going to earmark it to Eastern Kentucky safe. And these funds will go towards water and sewer infrastructure projects, the building of replacement school facilities and housing sites not previously used, but now designated to mitigate the risk of future flooding. So 
it's more, more, I guess you would say community wide projects, but there is some money in there to start help mitigating some of the, the housing there. There's a mechanism in there to help mitigate, mitigate parts of the housing concerns that are now arising. Sure. Sure. Now, now, and that, and that leads into, and once again, you may not know the answer to this, but I, I did see where Senator Brandon Smith had filed an amendment to add an additional 50 million um, yes. onto this package in specifically Correct. housing funds. What was, you know, once again, we're, so now we're starting, and, and that's for me, you know, gives me some pause because we're starting to get into government doing, it seems like more charity work, not just providing well, government and, services. You know, but what's I've, the thought process here where we can look at this? I'm not real sure because I've not had the opportunity to talk to Senator Smith uh, personally, nor, I mean, because the House was in session when the Senate was in session, I didn't have the opportunity to listen to uh, his remarks made on, on, on the the floor of the Senate when he made this, but just looking at the amendment itself, all it did was it was going to give $50 million to the Kentucky housing authority. I mean, there was no stipulations, no nothing, just we're going to give $50 million. And I think one, that's why a lot of people uh, like me as a representative, I would have been very concerned about just giving $50 million without saying this is to be used for this, this, and this. And, like, like with the, the bill that was passed, um, we have stuff in there. We have a ton of requirements, uh, the, the way the money is to be used, reporting requirements. You know, the money has uh, has to be uh, – uh, you've got to qualify for it for one. Uh, and uh, the then whoever receives the money, they've got to keep all the records of how the money was uh, spent, receipts, and then they got to report back. And then there's uh, – to the state, and then there's a reporting me mechanism in there for the state uh, uh, department. Let's see here, it's the state department of education and the state budget director. They have to prepare reports uh, for uh, the appropriations and revenue committees on how all of the money was spent and where it all went. So we've got a mechanism in there to one ensure that the money's being spent the way we wanted to and going for what we wanted to. But you know, with his amendment. If it would have been added and passed, there was no stipulations on how the $50 million would have been used. And so I would assume it would have just went straight to the Kentucky Housing Authority to do with as they they, they seem fit. And so that kind of leads into, um, you, you, you mentioned some of it there, so I don't know if you have much more of kind of the, the oversight, the fraud there, because I know that, you know, there was some discussion, take for an example, the, the with the Western Kentucky uh, fund. And, and I'm going to be honest, I don't know if it came from the actions of the legislature or it was from these, um, charity funds that Bashir sets up for the government, which I have said this priorly guys, I got to tell you, don't, if you're giving charity money out, give it to the Christian Appalachian product, give it to nonprofit. I don't know why government is creating <laughs> a, a not-for-profit charity fund um, there, but Bashir starts doing that on, on, on these disasters. But, you know, we saw something, um, regarding, for example, the, the trailers, they bought these camper trailers, they bought a lot of them and, and they maybe didn't make it to people. They end up being auctioned off or there's too many, but, and so there's, there's some concerns about misspending of funds. And like I said, I don't know if that was out of that charity organization or out of the actual bill there. So is there any safeguard? Because anytime you start talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in government mm -hmm. <laughs> and these types of things, you know, fraud, fraud comes up. And, and, and whether that is fraud by political fraud, as, as we've seen, uh, you know, Eastern Kentucky, mis, you know, the Democrats for years have mismanaged the coal severance money meant to help Eastern Kentucky instead doing things like paying for uh, Rupp Arena's uh, scoreboard with the money instead of developing yeah. the area's infrastructure so they can better stand on their own two feet. Um, is there, what do we have in here to make sure that these funds are not being misused or handed out to people outside of, do you have anything outside of the general oversight and tracking? No, but uh, not a whole lot, but I can give you all some re references here that to where anybody can go on the LRC webpage and look up the uh, the bill for this session. It's the only bill for the special session, so it'll be easy to find. Uh, but uh, like to help 
to give us a, a mechanism to better track the money is one of the reasons like the East Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky uh, safe uh, nonprofit or I, for lack of a better term, that's what we'll call it, nonprofit was established. Similar thing to what they did with Kentucky safe uh, for the, um, for the flood uh, that, that give us a mechanism and a, and, and a way to one appropriate the money for and disperse the money and keep a better track of it. Uh, so, and, but the bills, the bill itself spells that out and you can go to page two of the bill and it talks about how the money is to be appropriated for the fund uh, and how the money from the fund is to be, or how the money is to be taken from the fund and dispersed. It gives uh, the, the qualifications that people have to have to uh, meet is it, it, it lists who can apply for it. It's got a really nice uh, breakdown of, of what actually happens with that East Kentucky. And then if you go to page three of the bill, uh, it talks about who can receive the money, uh, or it talks about whoever receives the money, uh, the reporting requirements of, of what they have to do to account for every dollar spent. Where uh, once when they get the money, this is where it goes. This is what we spend it for. That types of uh, things. And then on page four and five, that's the reporting requirements of the final reports that go to the A&R committees that I mentioned earlier with the state budget director and the Department of Education. So, uh, I mean, it's a little bit wordy for me to sit here and read, uh, right. read to everybody, but I would encourage everybody go look the bill up. The bill is it's not a there's not a lot of. Uh, Legal legal ease in there. It's it's pretty easy to understand and pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, essentially, the bill creates a, um, I, I guess you'd call it a government trust fund that's being yeah. managed. It would be what we'd call it to to manage those dollars being handed out to be reimbursed to these other local government entities. Um, what? So so, is there anything now that you know of that? maybe Bashir or the Democrats really wanted this bill that weren't in there that we're going to hear them trying to attack Republicans over, over the next few months where they're trying to claim Republicans are, are mean misers that weren't charitable <laughs> enough, you know, that, that typical attack line. The only thing, I mean, the only comment outside of what was put in the bill that, that was a, a big talking point, and it wasn't just with Democrats, it was Republicans too, especially the ones that, that live in the affected areas. We're, we're, we're going to have to do something to help with the housing. And this uh, this really, this is more, let's get the infrastructure back up, because there's still a lot of the houses are still being assessed. Some of they're still determining whether, who's, what's going to have to be torn down, what can be rebuilt. And so this bill is really only just a temporary measure to get us to January. And then in January, when we come back into the general session, where you're probably going to see us passing another bill that can start uh, addressing some of the more specific needs uh, that like, like uh, private housing and stuff. And that was one of the bigger discussions. And I think that's one of the reasons that prompted Senator Smith's amendment to the bill. Uh, but uh I think if everybody kind of stays focused, and when I say everybody, I'm talking about politicians, community, citizens at large, everybody, everybody, just keep in mind this is a this is not a complete fix. It's a temporary bill to get us to the next step. And so, with that being said, there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, we were for the first time in, in my political career we were kind of on the same page together. As the and I mean. Republicans and Democrats. Uh, the, I, most of us, once when we read the bill, we understood this was just a temporary fix. We understood what was going into it. So I don't know if you're going to hear a lot of banter about what we couldn't get in this bill, but I think you will over the next several months as we start getting the assessments in and knowing and learning exactly what Eastern Kentucky, and for that matter, we're still learning about what some of the issues in Western Kentucky. You'll see, uh, you'll see people wanting to craft a bill that, that start dressing them. So I don't think we're going to have the controversy or the, or the, the discourse between what well, I needed this in this bill, because we already know that there's another bill coming in January. So everybody should have an opportunity to get stuff in there. If there is a specific need that they know of. Uh, but of course 
once when that bill's passed, as as with every bill in politics, there will probably be chatter and and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen online some comments on some stuff about Republicans taking too long, dragging their feet, people yeah. are hurting. And, and look, you know, we understand, you know, people people are, are going through some tough times. But at the same time, when you do not want your government reacting uh, emotionally, you want them reacting as logically as possible. Yeah, and with the facts. And right now we're still gathering the facts. But what we... What what I read off and what the the money was allocated for, we know these are issues that need to be fixed. Now we need to get the bridges fixed. We need to get the roads back up. We need to get the infrastructure reestablished. And so that's what this money is going to do. And another caveat to this is the fact that we didn't we did, didn't have the the ability to wait for FEMA to go through their process. That's why the state, you know, we can step up and get, let's get this fixed, and then we'll. Uh, we'll, we'll get give time for FEMA yeah, to go we'll through get the their finances process. worked out at a later date. So, and then you know, and and for and you, you may not know, and I it's it's been a debate for I think many years. It comes up every session. You know, what are we going to do about Eastern Kentucky? You know, historically, Eastern Kentucky was a vibrant had a lot of vibrant um, you know uh, economy there as far as coal and everything else goes and then when the 1990 clean air act passed it moved all of our coal jobs out west um out to the out to the rockies and then uh which created the coal severance fund which or, or not the coal severance fund, the coal fund which was meant to help develop out these areas and help do these infrastructures in place now i know and this is what people don't want to talk about, but you know, Democrats were the ones who misspent that. I mean, they were in charge of those funds and they'd spent them on things like little league uniforms and things that help them get reelected, but not things doing the, the great stuff. And I know we got broadband coming in, but you know, that, you know, and we've, we've covered that in this podcast that that contract is awful and technology has caught up to the point where, you know, for one tenth the cost, we can get internet to everybody like now using something like Starlink. But, um, you know, we're unfortunately stuck in that contract that the Democrats signed. But more importantly, as, as they, they go forward is what are the, is anybody talking about the one putting in place infrastructure to mitigate future floods? Yes. And then two, you know, for Eastern Kentucky, is there a grand plan for, for how to address Eastern Kentucky? Uh, first part of it, yes. Uh, there are uh, some of the monies that's being allocated with this, from this, uh, this bill is going to help uh, put things in place that would help mitigate future disasters as they re rebuild a lot of this infrastructure. So that is being talked about, and there are things already in the works. I mean, the million million dollar question is is how to pull Eastern Kentucky uh, out of the, the the grip of poverty with the de the decimation of the coal industry, and but I think what you what you can see the fact go back and look at what we've done over the past six years or six sessions, almost six years, as a Republican controlled majority in the House and the Senate. We've put together budgets, responsible budgets, that's created a $2.7 billion rainy day fund. So that's an example. We're, 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 we're working and we're looking and we're learning and we're putting things in place that are uh, re physically responsible uh, and that's going to help create other things and, and open up other venues to where we can help, help try to start rebuilding the, the economy in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, one of the things, you know, a lot of people don't realize uh, with the shutdown of the state, which I was totally opposed to. However, the one thing that we learned with the state being shut down with COVID in 2020 is the greater need for everybody to have uh, reliable high speed internet. If we can get that established, not only in Eastern Kentucky, but throughout all of rural Kentucky, that creates another economic tool for them to bring in economy and for people that live in these areas that are struggling to find jobs and, and work, another area or another opportunity to uh, to find a job. And when I say find a job, not just find a job, but find a really good paying job. And, 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 a, lot, and a lot of these bigger companies, especially a lot of these software and tech companies, they're realizing 
they can have somebody sit at home and and and, and work just as effectively as they could if they had to, had to to travel to an office or something somewhere. So that's just kind of an example. But you know, the push to to expand broadband that's going to be an economic tool that's not only going to benefit the whole state, but it's definitely going to benefit Eastern Kentucky in in the way of uh, creating a new. Uh, atmosphere a new avenue for jobs yeah no absolutely and careers but i think i guess the point i'm trying to to make is i think as we move forward that's going to be that's a question that's on our mind all the time our, my eastern kentucky colleagues do a great job making sure that their area and region of the state is in the forefront and, and in the thought process when we start putting pro- projects together and i said we're going and we're going to keep all this in mind and, and as we move forward try to be more responsible and, and better spend taxpayers. But although I think we're doing a pretty good job right now, we always have room to improve. Well, I'd, I'd love to see the budget come down, <laughs> you, you know, know, one year, you know, I'd love to see us we all like to see spin, so. spin less money one year, but you know, that's a different, longer conversation for a different time. Well, thank you. That's uh, a different show. Yeah, I know. Right? That's, that's a, that, that would be hours long debates there, but you know, thanks for joining us. Um, oh, no problem. Mark Hart. And, and I'm trying, I'm, I'm doing a lot of this from memory, from the meetings that I was in. Sure. And if I've misrepresented anything or if I confuse somebody, please reach out to me. If I don't have the answer, I will get you the answer and cl- get it clarified for you. I, I can say you're definitely a, a very easy to talk to um, legislator as far as that goes. Well, and, I appreciate that. I try. <laughs> yeah, no, and I, and absolutely. Well, hey, Thank you so much, sir, and and uh, I'll I'll see you later. Yep, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for All having right. me on. See you, Mark. Uh, bye. Bye. All right, guys. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, for joining us. And and you know, it, it's it's that age old question as we dig into it. What do we do with Eastern Kentucky? What do we do with these regions or or inner city regions? What do we do when we have an area? that has been decimated by prior government actions economically, right? We can talk about the EPA moving factories out of the inner cities. We can talk about the Clean Air Act in the 1990s, moving our coal jobs out to Western United States, financially decimating an area. We can talk about the tobacco fund. We can talk about how how making uh, um, the way they addressed hemp back in the 30s decimated Kentucky's agricultural uh, side of things and and also how we address tobacco um, and the the tobacco uh, to the point where they constantly have to create these funds too to help break people from it. We can even talk about how uh, the Kentucky farmer, the soybean farmer is incredibly dependent upon China as it's the number one uh, importer of Kentucky soybeans. And so what do we do in these areas? where we've got, maybe most of the time, it's not even the state government, but the federal government has come in. They've decimated an area. You know, people talk all the time about how Kentucky's pulling in there more than their fair share of the federal funds. But what they don't talk about is how much the federal government has truly destroyed regions like Kentucky and and large swaths with the regulations. And what do we do? What do we do? I mean, we've broken an area's leg and then how do we help them? What is the role? And, and a lot of people talk, hey, it's, it's, it, it would be more comfortable for me, certainly, if government didn't have to get involved in these situations and private charity and insurance and everything else could deal with these natural disasters. But unfortunately, when you have areas that the government has historically messed with, what do you do and how do you address that? That is a massive debate and a massive conversation. And and the only thing we can hope for is that we learn from our mistakes and we try to regulate less and, and therefore spend less as a government. And that way we don't have to shell out hundreds of millions of dollars necessarily. And, and you heard Mark talking about how they're looking at what they do with private housing and everything else. And, and hopefully we get to a point where we're not as reliant upon government to do that, but we have to learn our lessons from the past. And, and, you know, based upon what I'm seeing out of the Biden administration, they're not learning those lessons based upon what we're seeing with the EPA. They are not learning those lessons. Well, thank you guys for joining me for this special episode of the Andrew Kuberwriter show. Thanks Mark once again for joining us. And, you know, I'm looking forward uh, to next week here as we, as we dig into it. This is the first time I think I've had somebody on this show in a long time to kind of interview. We might be doing a few more of these 
you know, I might try to get on all the governor candidates, ask them the same questions, the same exact questions. So that way you can, as a, as a listener, compare them. Um, that may be something we try to do on the show. I don't know. Give me feedback, comment what you want us. If, if, if that's something you think you might be into, uh, let us know. And, you know, thank you guys so much for joining me and have a great, great rest of the day. Thank you so much. Thank you.